for being here and maybe no. I think uh -oh. yeah. uh, it's it's been a great uh this a great visit I'm having at USC. I'm, I'm very impressed with the research opportunities. The, the opportunity for career development and, and the quality of, of uh, research that's going on here. Um, thank you for having me. Thank you for uh, your time. As uh, David uh, indicated that the study in my talk is going to be the, the study design and statistical modeling for uh, to enable data-driven decisions of policies in the opioid epidemic. And I will tell you a little bit about the background of what's going on in the state of Ohio and the nation about that. But before that, I wanted to tell you a little bit of, you know, like a roadmap of my background. And um, this start with a professional background and, and how I made it here to the States. And then I will tell you a little bit about my research experiences and how that will, uh, you know, you know, gain experience and, and, and inform what I do now and the roles that I have that. I'll present a little bit about my philosophy that uh, informs basically what and shapes whatever I I would like to do next. In my red sorry. Um. So I was born in Uruguay. That's my thick accent. I'm sorry for that. Um. In 1994, uh, while I was uh, working on a on a actually uh, animal green company in genetics after doing my diploma in agronomy and genetics in Uruguay, I, um, I decided that I needed to learn more about statistics and genetics. Um, and in 1994, I received a acceptance letter from Iowa State University. It's one of the top uh, programs in the nation in terms of applied statistics and genetics and thought that that kind of was a good fit for me, and I was accepted to the program and came to pursue graduate studies uh, right after. In 2001, I received my PhD in statistics and animal breeding and genetics from Iowa State University. And so the same year, I joined Ohio State, the Ohio State University, as a visiting scholar in the statistics department. And, and this is a college of arts and sciences, a very kind of traditional statistics department, more not as applied as Iowa State, more methods in terms of, of, of theory and everything. Um, when, that position, when the department opens a position for me to start a tenure track in the statistics department, the, the center, Stan Lemeshow, that was starting the Center for Biophysics at Ohio State, recruited me to, to be part of that foundation grew right that a new center for excellence at biostatistics is a center why center is being formed and at Ohio State. And I thought that that was a better opportunity given my more applied background and decided to work more into you know bio field that that, that, that was going to be a, a better fit. And that's when I jumped both and moved to uh, be part of that group that started the Center for Biostatistics. There. You will see that this micro trajectory is not a very straight line, but there is one common denominator here that is the Center for Biostatistics. And the Center for Biostatistics that is developed, that been developed at OSU, has, has some also kind of evolution and how it evolved from different colleges. So, note that in 2003, my research, my title was a research scientist with the anticipation that there's going to be a you know, faculty. Uh, position open in what was the School of Public Health, which was part of the College of Medicine for my appointments at the center is for me. Right? So then is when I started as a research assistant professor in the College of Public Health. Well, wait a minute. I left what is now the College of Public Health. So what happened here and what I forgot to tell you is that the School of Public Health divided or the, uh, split, it was a split from College of Medicine. So there was a divorce there between medicine and public health. And now we have a new College of Public Health. So my research assistant appointment is in the Division of Biostatistics in the College of Public Health. 
yet I am part of the center. I know my funding is in the College of Medicine. Uh, so research uh, of how to do any of that. I was promoted to visit a, 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 a associate professor in the College of Public Health in 2010. We went through all the same, same struggle that tenure track faculty go through. And, and, and that is something I want to tell you about that the research track in College of Public Health was basically identical to tenure track, with the exception that the research track has to be 100% funded. And the, the, the advantage is the research track doesn't have a clock. Tenure tracks have a clock, but the, the tenure track faculty need 50% funding, a research track 100% funding. So, okay, fine. The, the, this, uh, uh, my funding is all in College of Medicine. I am part of the College of Public Health faculty. There are some issues here, policies regarding indirects, right? My indirects were all to public health, but College of Medicine uh, basically is giving indirects away to College of Public Health. So that's when they decided to form a department of biomedical informatics in the College of Medicine. And now my appointment goes to College of Medicine. So, okay. So there is a professor, research associate professor in biomedical informatics now in College of Medicine, still part of the Center for Biostatistics. The center is a university wide center, right? But it's still growing, and, and we are hiring and, and growing. In 2013, there is some changes in the center. There is a national search for a director. I, I became, became the director of the Center for Biostatistics. Right after that, the the department, the BMI department, where my appointment is, has a new chair, and the new chair comes. And what happened right before then is that we have this competition between research track and tenure track in the department. Faculty, I mean, the research track feel that are not being appreciated, that there is bad culture, that they need to get all the funding, that uh, they, they, there is that despite this in salary. Uh, that creates a uh, tumor in the department, and we lost in five months. We lost four excellent junior faculty to universities of the same life in one new Wake, uh, uh, Wake Forest, and in and, and uh, Emory, among others. Uh, I I UP is the other one. So so then this when the dean of college of medicine that I got all that criticism and goals. To the new chair of the department, you need to fix this. You need to fix the trust. So there is there, there are some issues here. We need to fix it. And then I I got asked uh, for you know I got you know fixing the the PNT document to appreciate the insights. That was that was part of the, the the complaint of everybody. Nobody nobody appreciates our contributions. While NIH and all this funding, the federations are promoting team science, academic institutions, there is there is a mismatch, right? And, and we need to fix that. So we did. And now we have created very separate tracks in BMR, biomedical informatics. Uh, we do have a research track, but it is really not used because of the 100 percent funding requirement. There is a clinical track and there is a senior track. There are very, very different there were differences. There are steam sciences, steam science component in all of them. The difference between the tenure track and the clinical track is that the tenure track is expected that you are PI or MPI on, on grants or you need course, you know, that demonstrate your contribution to in science. For the clinical track, it's okay to be co-I on grants. And there is a little bit different expectations in terms of funding. One is up to 50%, the other one is 70%. There are teaching expectations in both tracks. Of course, the new track is a uh, you know, heavier load and things like that. But just to tell you that that then, and, and maybe that was granted in the title of vice chair for team science in the College of Medicine. Um, so since I think 2019, my research track was not research anymore. I thought it was being tenure track. So all the same process, external letters, all that again, right? Mm -hmm. I was just promoted professors, all that. And here I am now, <laughs> 2022. I'm also leading the department has divided into three sections. I, I lead the one by diabetes and population health science. And I'm sorry if it was too long, it's supposed to be short, but I wanted to tell you that, that I thought it's important because it's an important part of, of how I am, Koyama. Um, 
So this, uh, I'm going to start talking about uh, research now, and this is a, a big grant that we got in the state of Ohio, where I lead the biostatistics team. And, um, and uh, it's uh, NIA funded, but it's also the, the Mental Health Institute and other institutes that put a lot of money uh, on a very important initiative, which is called the HEAL Initiative. Uh, to assess issues or relations with the opioid pandemic uh, or epidemic. Um, we decide, we, we uh, developed the design of a of on my trial, um, which is a community-based uh, study to reduce op opioid overdose in Ohio. I have the lead of what before. This is about the, the funding that gets uh, Dr. Rebecca Jackson and, and, and when have are the PIs for the Ohio site? And I want to tell you that I don't know where you will know, but Rebecca Jackson was the, the director of CPSI at uh, Ohio State, and she recently passed away, and she has been one of the greatest mentors that I had in my career. And, yeah, or so. So the motivation behind when we got the RFA, and actually Becky was the one that said, Soledad, you need to help me with this. We're gonna need to work, we're gonna get this. And that, that is the type of woman that she was. And the other thing is that uh, she is she was in a wheelchair, an amazing person. Um so the, the, the RFA comes out comes up from NIA with very specific stipulations, very quick that we need to respond to the RFA. The stipulations are that uh, we need to use a set of integrated or evidence-based uh, 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 approaches to, to that they need to propose to do a community-based study. Their goal is to reduce for it, the opioid overdose rate uh, over the opioid um, uh, uh, mortality rate by 40% in three years. The 40% is great, the three years is not so great because it's not a short period of time. The applicants have said on the RFA that we need to use a cluster randomized trial or a cluster step wedge design. That's a must. The study, if there is a control, we need to make sure that all communities eventually get the intervention. And there are very specific things. So this is a state level of community based study. We need to define what the communities are, but at least 15 communities need to be part of uh, the study, and then at least 30% of whatever you define your communities have to be in the rural setting. The why, why open and why this was something that Becky was really after, you know, like, you know, it, this is the, the evolution of the opioid. Um, uh, Overdose death in Ohio in 2016, they are at a very high level. If you look at years that come here, there is a very steep curve in all this, right? So the top, the blue is the total deaths, the total number of deaths in Ohio. That you can see that the, the deaths associated with opioid fall over the day, a uh, very similar pattern. And the uh, ones that you know are seen that have been causing most of the deaths are synthetic opiates. And see, you know, heroin is not as prevalent or not doing having such a effect on The current US opioid uh, uh, pandemic epidemic has been going for decades now, but it was declared as a as an emergency in 2017. Ohio, unfortunately, ranks very high on, on this pandemic, this fourth in the nation, with a rate of 42.7 deaths per 100,000, which is more than 1.5 of what is the national level. So it was a strong motivation of why Ohio needed this type of funding. Another uh, issue, another good thing or features about Ohio were that, you know, we had kind of like, uh, geographically or strategically located CTSAs in the state. Uh, there is the, the Ohio Valley uh, node for NIA, the Middle Trials Network in uh, Cincinnati. And, and there was already, there were a lot of options, like it was a network, you know, things in the state is trying to do things in terms of to reduce what's 
you know, is to do something about this crisis. So we, okay, it was clear from the discussions, you know, we were working on this and this proposal. There is a room full of people from social, people from as a, a social work, people, you know, from communications, biostatisticians, medicine, you name it, I send the room, you know, are, you know, govern the room with Becky kind of leading the discussions, right? And we split up in work and, you know, working groups and who is going to do what. We kind of split the RFA apart of what exactly we need to, to do. So it was, uh, we need to use evidence-based practice, right? That things that we know work uh, to reduce opioid uh, use disorder, right? But the problem is that there was, why there was things not were done, were done because there is a huge gap between what was happening in the community and what, you know, these practices, what people should be doing in the practice. There had to be a community engaged process before using, you know, applying these data driven decision uh, making uh, approaches. When they start putting the menu of all the things that could be done uh, to reduce the opioid crisis, statisticians that were in the room were like, no, you have to be kidding me. And like running a study where, when you have 20 different treatments, right? We are not, no, there's no way that we can design a study to, you know, test all these different EVPs in one study, right? So we need to have, we need to limit them. And that was our thing. We are not going to run a study where we're going to test 15 different treatments. Um, and then, um, so what we decided though, that the, 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 the uh, physician decided, okay, we're going to put those in, package, in, in packages. So they decided that three packages was how they were going to kind of, right? Yeah. But then you need to give communities the option to pick on that, on that right? Because some community might be doing something, this community might not be doing that. We need to, we need to be, you know, give them the option. This is participatory, the community participatory research, right? They, you cannot go and say you're going to do this and, and if you don't like it, the that. So they have to have a say on that. And but still, we needed some things that they were very critical that needed to be there. And one was the knowledge on distribution. Right as uh, O and B, there were things. There are things also that the evidence-based uh, uh, practices that that we want to hear is a little bit of medicate or medicated overuse, uh, overdose use disorder. Right, is how you know people go to treatments to try to to quit uh, being dependent on opioids. So those 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 uh, treatments or interventions need to be there. And uh, the, the third bucket was there has to be, you know, education on prescription of your safety. So basically, those were kind of like the three theme, themes or topics behind each of these packages. So here is, a, you know, in a, in a again, nutshell, what was happening. So we had to cover the four different settings, right, from health care, behavioral health, uh, correction and, and law enforcement, and this is the jail, jail system and education and community outreach. Those they need to be covered, and these were the three packages for us of what they contain. Right? Um, the analysis on distribution, the the MAT Medicaid assisted treatment, and the OUD prevention and prescription set. The community selection and what, how we're going to remember communities was a very, very thing. You know, you can define communities whatever you want. Are you working with schools? Are you working with, you know, whatever? We had to define communities. It was a long discussion about what is going to be a, a, a community for us. It has to be comprehensive to the whole state. What are the things? So the things are just, are we going to divide communities by census tract? Are we going to talk about counties? Uh, we were to talk about townships, a lot of discussion, <laughs> right? Uh, but so there was a phase, you know, like the things were evolving and things are being discussed. Uh, I think we were kind of like centering into they're going to be using counties as our kind of community and things are going to be done at the county level. So at phase one was to be okay, well, let's go and look at uh, Ohio, Ohio has. 
um, in the 1990s. So that's something I get confused with Iowa and, and Ohio all the time, the number of counties is similar. Um, and there has to be, you know, we have to do a lot of analysis of what's going on in the counties, what are they doing in terms of opioid prices, and then uh, the sampling, how we're we gonna sample counties. We cannot do it on every single county. So uh, they, they were discussions, okay, we don't want adjacent counties to be part of you know, this because we don't want the spillover effect. We didn't want to include this, uh, you know, this initiative going on in Ohio, the Adam counties that have a, a, are part of this because we don't want to mess up with what they are doing on the and on the country. But then we have to have that from the RSA that the rate of COVID rate, uh, rate of adaptation has to be selected I have to be for community that is more than 25, largely equal to 25 deaths per 100,000 with, uh, or, uh, and the rural areas more than 22 deaths per 100,000. So here we are, right? So now we have, this is the, the state in Ohio, uh, state map, uh, and we got a random sample of these communities that are not adjacent, right? So we ended up uh, that we, that was a sample that we select that is random and I, I'm lucky because I can tell you how random this was. It was, you know, we put all these constraints, you run it in a GIS and then give me a sample and then, ah, uh, is that, that's it, look good? Yeah, no, okay, now maybe we'll get another random sample until we got what we wanted, right? <laughs> It's very random, <laughs> um, but it was a very representative sample in the sense that it's we wanted something that they covers the whole area that covers these these are the Appalachian that is you know very very uh, particular in terms of what what features those counties have. There are the the mix between rural and rural counties, and we were covering forty percent of the Ohio population. Ten counties are urban, nine are rural, right? Seven of those 19 are in the Appalachian. Um, more than half an, an unemployment rate greater than the statewide median. And that was someone's, uh, what I say, social determinant of health that I thought was important to cover. So, you know, this poverty and you know, affecting uh, this or unemployment. Uh, racial and ethnicity, as much as far as you can get in the state of Ohio. <clears throat> But there were underrepresented minorities, 27% of those. And uh, it has a metric of opioid fatality or passes what we wanted. Um, there were more than uh, 1,700 deaths in 2017. Uh, 26,000 or more than 26,000 persons identified with OUD disorders. And 14, uh, more than 14,000 people were classified as uh, misusing but, opioids. But yeah. if you go back to the map, <clears throat> How distributed are the some of these characteristics? Like, for example, racial and ethnic diversity. I would imagine most of that is in Cuyahoga or in Hamilton count, County, and probably maybe also the fatality rates and other things being. They were not very balanced, but but across communities, pretty. But they are pretty balanced. And here is the argument. This is a counter argument. I think that that was a question that was raised at site visit when we got NIDA, so we got a score, and then NIDA went to Ohio, to Ohio State, and said, okay, let me see where, whatever you say is true. So basically, that kind of uh, variability yeah. mimics the nation, what is going on in the US. So we thought that we are, our argument is, look, if this works in Ohio, and you translate it to the nation, you're going to have the same thing, right? Because we are not in the nation. We're not homogeneous in in. How this algorithm is presented. This, this so here are comes a little bit of statistics and, and, and how to remember that we had to put the, the cluster on the mind uh, design uh, on top of these these limitations or in terms of period, the time period and the 40% re reduction. So we decided to use the two overlapping multi-phase step wedge design. And, um, and, and we thought that that was the, the, our proposal has a balance between the scientific rigor and what the ethics of using these DVPs. Um, 
So I, I, let me show you this first. So here is the, the, the design that we have. So here we have more than three years. So three years that we here. And we said, okay, we're gonna have like four, like three waves. So we're gonna randomize the counties into, you know, who is going to start intervention by whatever I do in three ways in a step wedge fashion, right? So here's the, the first step wedge design, and this is the one that is powered to achieve 40% in three years. And the one that choose are, remember that we have three interventions, right? So we said, we're gonna do first, we're gonna do in a step wedge uh, design, we're gonna use the First two interventions that we think are going to have the greatest impact and they're gonna help us get the reduced reduction of 40%, right? The third intervention, which is more like prevention and you know helping prescription, that is going to be kind of like the icing on the cake. Like we're gonna try, we're gonna build another situation, we are gonna add it later on, and we're going to be able to um, test the added effect of the three intervention, the third intervention on this step wedge wedge design. And I don't know where you know what the step wedge design is, but basically what happens is that you, you everybody gets intervention. The, 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 when you're randomizing uh, uh, clusters or counties, so is when they get intervention. Eventually everybody gets it. But when is that? So the and then the orange, right? So you're you are building your control groups that are not completely simultaneous, simultaneous to when you do the intervention, but there is evidence to you know show that that this you know is, is a robust design for testing effect of these interventions when you do it in this startup start way. Um, I'm forgetting something, but I will. Oh, then there is this, this, this uh, empty cells, right? The intervention, these are community-based interventions, approaches. They are not affecting the day you start with. You. So you need to build a transition period and when you're going to measure the, the actual effect. Because first you need to go to your community, educate, blah, blah. It takes time to, to, to get to that place. So basically, this explains what I just uh, said, right? Um, and I don't think I, the, the lack of shading is implementation phase. It's not part of the statistical design. And once, oh, that was our thing. Once counties, these counties, so <laughs> when counties start receiving the third intervention, they are not part of the, the primary, the, the test for the primary hypothesis. So the model that we proposed for this design was a generalized linear model with a Poisson distribution for the rate. Because again, if you look at compare the rate of death across, you know, what the, the population, right? This is still a sort of a, you know, Poisson distribution, you know, it's, it's, it's rare. So, so the model was a, a generalized linear model where we have, uh, you know, the effect for treatment A, and we have the add on, uh, treatment B or uh, the effect of the add on, or whatever was the third one, right? And, um, and we have to build cluster, you know, run several random effects, right? We have to build a random effect for cluster or county, right? Um, that or um, in the design, random effect for the time that the cluster starts getting intervention within the way, right? They all start at different time. And then the random effect with the of subject within cluster, right? And then you have kind of um, uh, so the advantages of stepwise design that we're happy with is that it requires a smaller amount of resources at a given time, right? Because we need to go to the community, so we can do that in basically uh, ways. Uh, so it, just, it reduces it reduces the ethical concern that everybody gets a treatment eventually. Oh, and this is something I forgot to say when I have that picture. That the, that the other the thing that happens is that interventions are and the way we implement science, or we are doing this, is getting better, right? Uh, as you move on. So if counties complain that, oh, I am the last, I'm going to be, I'm going to be randomized to the last group that gets intervention, yeah, but you get it better, right? Because we 
improved, right? So you get a better intervention mm -hmm. as you move on, and that was how you know, um, yeah. Was well, if you go back to your step design, sorry, the pre this one here, the counties, <clears throat> the one through seven, the eight through thirteen, the fourteen through nineteen, is that randomized or is it sort of conditionally randomized based on density and that's rates exactly and right. other things? Yeah, it's a covariate constraint. It's okay. randomized based on population size, on opioid deaths, uh, uh, or you know, incidence of opioid over. Uh, oh, uh, that, but and also rural or remember that we had to have a mix of rural and urban. We need to be careful how we put them in the three ways. So that's a great question. Okay, we got a good score. We got it funded, but there were some issues with the study uh, or, or consideration of the studies. Whether it's, and, and my disclaimer, to those issues, wait a minute, we did what you told us in the RFA, so don't complain now. But okay, <laughs> that's a side note. But one is, well, you know, you're making all these packages, it's difficult to evaluate the individual intervening effects. Yeah, but we are not going to be doing 15 different treatments in, you know, in this period of time. So I think that was very good for me. The one that was critical, but they were absolutely right now that we're in the study, is Six months for, for baseline and six months for transition time. If you look at these uh, things, we then separated by six, six months, it's not enough. No, it's not. It's, 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 it's almost impossible. Perhaps. You cannot get this up and running in six months. And, and then there was this remember how we have the overlapping segues? There was some comment that, okay, well, there is a contamination effect because we one is already adding. Uh, at the third package, and you have started implementing, you know, the first two packages in the last way. There is going to be some cross contamination. This well, why? That's why we have them spread out a bit, safe and, and all that. But okay, that that is a problem. And then the, the question was, do you really have the your statistical power, um, given the the design? The final design ended up being so four four states got. Score good scores and body rounds, right? Uh, Massachusetts, Kentucky, Ohio. Huh? Kentucky, Ohio, New York, right? And, and the final design is a combined design with all these states. It is in the largest community based prevention study in the field of addiction. So at the kickoff meeting, when, when they bring us to all together and we ended up saying, well, you can work all separate, do your own one, or you can you know, join forces and get the four states with a common design and common model, and this is what we're doing. So the great news is that we are going to have uh, three other states doing this with us. Uh, we have consensus, and basically we're not doing a study that involves 10 million people. Uh, but the final design was not a third wish. It was a final group that's randomized way to this control uh, trial. Basically, it's a, a step wish with just two waves. But the, the actual design, what we have is there are two ways. So forget about the third one. And we do the implementation. That gives us more time for doing the implementation part. And the comparison, way one and way two, is, is parallel. And it's only one year. The rest is. Implementation or sustainability of what it was. Are you still adding in three beyond one and two? No. Design? So the three things are now, so these are the three packages, but they need to do it all together. So it's the, the new intervention called communities that hit that here. Communities, CPH, CPH, and this is the CPH. So they pick from these venues. It's still, they need, to, they need to pick one or two here. One or two here, and then one from here. So the CTH would be, you know, there are differences among, you know, between the states, but they are all together in one. So at the end, uh, <laughs> this has been run. We are on way two, finalizing way two now. Um, the 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 testing period already ended, and we are looking at. When are we the RTI, which is the, the big kind of variable in the province, is the analysis and data coming up.
what I can tell you is that if we look at uh, distribution of nanoton, all the states, they are eight, you know, was, you know, there are differences between way one and way two. And hopefully that will lead to whatever reduction we needed uh, to achieve in the three year period. A study that I just co-founded, uh, that we just co-founded with our collaborators on um, in, in my department, Betty was also part of it, and and um, this is in the College of Social Work. Is it kind of spun off this big hill study, but this is an R01. I am the contact PI, and the idea with this study is basically to use to build a big data plan in we call OSADEM. And I tell you why is the oh hi well the opium and some something is sort their data template. Um that um that, that is also using different um data that comes uh different you know yeah, administrative data, individual data, different stakeholders that are providing data to build this big data lake to build predictive models and surveillance algorithms using different approaches to uh, find hot spots in Ohio. And the third aim is to basically how we're going to go back to the communities and give these tools so uh, you know healthcare units, behavioral health care, or you know, other systems can use these tools to change policy. Um, there's based on you know we have uh, the, the novel part here is the urine uh, drug testing data that is provided by Millennium Health. This is a, a company that does basically all UDPs in the nation, but is a, the major provider for Ohio. Uh, it has data on about uh, four million people, and, and, and you know tests that you know their uh, longitudinal data uh, over five years from you know starting to. 2013 and on. And that data paired with administrative data, uh, we have already demonstrated that there is a big correlation and can be used to predict over those mortality. Um, there's uh, this, these are the databases are our, our, the, the, our initiatives include social determinants of health. Ohio, the state of Ohio, given that such a disaster that's going on with the opioid uh, epidemic, has constructed this, uh, whatever we call Ohio Opportunity Index. These are indexes that collect information from 34, 30, you know, different variables in terms of poverty, neighborhood, uh, you know, dynamics, and all the data about the community or the, the administrative data. Of course, we have from the Ohio the, the death mortality. Uh, rates in the state over the years. So everything, all that is being put together in a data lake or data intake. And we're going to use that data to build this algorithm. The approaches that we're proposing are a spatial temporal vision model, machine learning. The idea is to, to study these temporal relationships and see how this could be used to uh, predict uh, more time. And then the, the human center platform and actual informatics. This is something that uh, people in my department they have. I think that there are people that do implemental implementation science and clinical informatics. So so our uh, colleague uh, Nali Farid, uh, he's really good at that, and he's he's the one doing this type of uh, tool, developing these tools for the heal grants. So we are proposing a bigger and better you know way of getting back to the community. These are all the data types are going to be linked in that uh, data link. Um, there is there is going to be uh, you know as I said the data at different levels individual level, community level, state level. They are all going to be merged in in one database. Um, I don't know how I'm going to do it in time, but it seems I've been talking for a while, so I need to kind of rush up a little bit. Uh, this this is how these the steps or how these data are going to be linked. We're going to start with you know geospatial linking and and this sense of track seed code at the county level to get harmonized the databases that are at the state level. The individual data are going to be merged via the claims database 
to that state level of data. There is all this process of tokenization that informaticians talk about. We have tokens and just, you know, like how you merge data. Yeah, <laughs> so, uh, like Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, we are in the business of Bitcoin like that. <laughs> but, uh, but basically how this big master database is going to be and it's not going to be able to, it has to be de-identified. We cannot go back and identify individuals or remark to individual. Uh, and when we create this database, the database is going to be available. The idea that we propose is to researchers, in researchers, state agencies, community members, policymakers, and, and, and others. Um, the model development and, and tool integration, the idea is to identify to, to the high risk populations and geographically restricted regions, right? And that is our, uh, that was a geospatial part. The things that happen with opioid is that things start in a community without sounding any alarm until the problem has spread out too fast to to be. So we need to be able to attack, you know, these hotspots, you know, quickly, right? And the idea was to again to use these models and also validate the model performance. And uh, we have enough years that we can use the training testing and validation sets for this forecasting algorithm. The Bayesian Poisson model that we are proposing is uh, this it is here. Um, it has some you know spatial you know random effects to account for that that uh, geospatial thing. And these are of course the you know people priors and 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 the use and you know the hierarchy, hierarchy that you build under underneath those random effects. Is this the same? <clears throat> Sorry, within Ohio, these are different geographic regions though than the previous study. Or are, we, are you overlapping on that sampling design as well? Great like question. Yes, originally we thought that we we're going to do it for the same the same geographic region, but then this you know we said no no we need to go bigger. So. The problem is that there is a lot of heterogeneity in the terms of data you get from different counties. And actually, there are 88 counties. So, you know, so I want to anticipate. Uh, but so they get to do it for the whole, for the whole state. Every county. Yeah. Every county. The, the AI ML approach, I am not an AI uh, machine learning person. I work with Dr. Uh, Ping Tang, he's, he's an expert in this, but the idea on what we propose is, okay, we're gonna use AI approach to do the feature selection for both models, for what is going to go in the AI ML approach, but also what's going on in the vision spatial model. Remember that we are having data from, you, know, you name it, and we need to be able to kind of say, what are the, the, the features that are going to be in, in tomorrow? We're gonna use AI machine learning for, for selecting the features that go into the two models, right? And the, the idea then is that, okay, uh, we are going to compare the model performance and see basically who wins uh, in terms of the probability and, mm -hmm. and validation of the models. And the third aim I told you is a community-based tools uh, engagement. And this is our uh, collaborator, Nalid uh, Farid. As I told you before, he's been done. He's already in the, in the heel, uh, heel study and how he deals dashboards and these tools and how they go. But the communities are giving us the data and they are participating in this by saying we want this back, right? They need it back. They want to use it for whatever reason, even for developing education uh, uh, um, approaches. So how we go back to the communities is by, you know, building these tools, an informatics tool that they can actually look at and, and interpret and what's going on. And obviously in how we need to uh, disseminate and, and how these tools are available for the scientific community. So that was our entry. The opportunities and new ideas that this uh, one brings is there is a cluster of other projects under this uh, heel supplement, but there are this is a standalone R1. So we 
the, the data intake is going to be there for whatever modeling approach you want to use. So that could be you know, something that we can learn or kind of change as we go. And it, there are opportunities for building other collaborative projects and relationships. There's going to be at least dynamic and adaptation kind of uh, setting that, um, that we are going to incorporate other ideas and could be, you know, expand even larger. And there are other data sources that could be included as, uh, you know, as part of these, uh, you know, some of these are the neonatal, uh, I said, Austin, Austin, Austin syndrome and neonatal risk or that you know, as, uh, opioid withdrawal syndrome. Um, that could be added in addition to behavioral health and mental health um, added to this database. To, to, to enlarge the, the data intake. Okay, so that was the end, and uh, I wanted to tell you about that this is in conclusion, what I have done in my entire life is focusing on team science, but having, you know, my contribution to, to that, the fact that, you know, I could, show that I could be PI or NPI in grants. I have led multiple vitamin course on PO1, is course on our one, and it's all based on team science. What is team science? Well, is you know, by Wikipedia, is a collaborative and often cross-disciplinary approach to scientific inquiry that brings researchers that otherwise are isolated. We bring all together the same thing. My philosophy, across my career has been to becoming very deeply engaged in research, and this will promote respect and trust, which is the foundation of successful team science and collaborative project. And this will result in the sophisticated analysis of data and contributions to science. So we move science advanced. Um, my research interests are in study design, comparative tracking methods, and analysis in the areas of clinical trials, population trials, mostly. I have done a lot of work in basic science as well, and I have developed and implemented and led comprehensive approaches in numerous NIH, NCI, and PCORI funded studies. What I think I want to go next is we have a more common goal and data network and coordinating centers. For the reason that I think that this is the perfect um, motivator to bring data sources together to answer clinically relevant questions, but are also opportunities that do innovation in terms of how we engage patients and scientific community and and the same room. Um, it's, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's the, the basics for transdisciplinary biomedical informatics. This, 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 uh, these opportunities are great for developing uh, approaches in terms of education and training, and training not, education training not only for students, but uh, physician scientists, that's something super important in college and medicine. And of course, for people that work with data, these are opportunities for building new pipelines and, and algorithms. With this, I don't know where it talks to fast, but I have some references. Um, one thing that I can tell you is that this paper came up with the, the multi-phase step wage design. We ended up with a paper uh, view. He said that it was not the design that was used. For this study, we ended up with a paper in statistical uh, in statistics in medicine uh, that uh, looks at the issues with the variance of you know um, for this multiple state established design, and we came up with closed forms for uh, variance uh, variance that could be used in sample size and power calculation. That was something that. Uh, was on the critique and saying, look, you are using an approximation method to get a sample size in power analysis for established design. There is no real method. Well, we came up with one in establishing studies in medicine. So again, going back to that, these are good motivators that could, you know, you know, you can develop your own research, but you also can use to advance science and, and education and training programs and uh, for physician scientists and 
and the students as well. Thank you. Any questions from those in the room or? I have one, one question <clears throat> just to go back to your design. Uh, I wasn't sure if you had an issue with dropping out, like say if the community said, uh, they didn't want to participate, I quit, I want to do my own thing. Um, if you have an issue with dropping out or lost a- Yes, um, and it happened in Ohio. And it was such whole. So when we combined the four states, we ended up with 67 communities. Uh, 34 rural, 33 urban. One of the counties in Ohio dropped out, and but that was the only one. In our design, we have the intention to treat, that these are going to be, you know, it's an intention to treat basis. The, the, um, the county that dropped out was after an decision. So now we need to include in the statistic analysis, even though the implementation hasn't started yet. And oh my gosh, again, bunch of this, you know, tons of discussion about how we're gonna do this and the statistics team met and so well, we need to go for a protocol. It's intention to treat, it has to be intention to treat. And um this was a community uh randomized to way one, believe it or not, it is the way one, and they dropped out. So sorry one was good. But I were going to do a sensitivity analysis. I think it was more than Say that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you're you're focusing on four states, right? Yes. Um, are, you know, if there are other efforts going on in any of the other forty six states. I'm pretty sure there are. Now it's all in the news. You've seen that. Uh, it shows up in CNN in almost every other Florida. It's a big mess. Um, it's there are there are initiatives going on. The problem is the gap, right? So we know they know what works. They know how to stop this, right? In terms of medication, right? They could stop with you know, you know, finding all those distribution centers, the drug dealers. But but what works in terms of medica med medication is well known. The problem is that is well, there is an issue with stigma. People don't want to you know, you don't get to the population and say who is. You know, doing drugs here, who has a disorder, they're gonna come, come up front and say, I need help, right? So it's all that education, it's a huge gap that is going on between what the treatments are available and people actually going to get treated or being treated. It's, and some people don't even know. You read the news. I read that every time I see a field team death or something, I go to the article and say, and, and I, I read an article recently. The mom knew that the guy was, and, and it breaks my heart. I, I that makes me cry. I don't even know the word about the story, but it's a, a teenager that you know he had issues with depression. He tells his mom that he is doing drugs and he's tried everything, and it gives me goosebumps. I cannot finish. But 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 if, you know she said, "Mom, I'm safe. I'm in a problem." One day the mom goes to the basement and and he is dead because he got this this. Uh, thank you. That was, you know, plenty of, you know, ways and keeps going, right? So, given these last two questions, I, I assume you're doing some follow up in terms of implementation and yes, sustainability. Yes. And yes, there is a lot of going on in terms of implementation science, and we call that the de novo data because these data are being collected at the state level and they are somewhat different across the states. Every state is looking at implementation a little bit different. So yes, we yeah, there are very long terms. So just <clears throat> in expanding this to four states, is the analysis going to be sort of performed independently in each state and then a meta-analysis or is the data really all together and you will do one analysis controlling for or and investigating effect heterogeneity across states and counties? All that is, yeah. So the primary analysis for the, the primary hypothesis is the all combined. All combined. NIDA did not. In, in fact, I don't think that the states have the data yet because it's been analyzed as the coordinating center and say so you're not touching it until we come out with the combined analysis. 
is we're using a little bit different model now. Well, yes, we talk to the, the, the coordinating center. We have weekly meetings with them. The, the, the statisticians group from the four states with RTI talk about all this weekly basis. We talk about, we know exactly what we're doing, but we cannot see the results yet. Um, it's a, a negative binomial model where we have the, the, the certification, the certified the recovery that I will use for certification are part of the uh, the the factors in the model and yeah, very easy that too. Eventually the states will get the data, I think, to do their own things. But but yeah, the primary hypothesis is the whole the four states. Any other questions in the room online? Okay. All right. Thank you all. Thank you.